First of all, it's my great honor to be invited, and thank you, Kate, for your invitation. And uh, it's uh, my um, first time to join this com conference. And according to Kate, uh, your description, this has lasted uh, actually many decades. Um, I am an uh, um, academic, so I'm not policymaker. I do not provide solutions, answers. And um, I'm providing a conceptual frameworks, so I'm doing this. So here I'm trying to give some of my uh, kind of inter interpretations on the rise of China, especially on the nexus between rise of China and the global order. In the last 10 years, I tried to edit a couple of volumes on the rise of China and in the existing world order. And these are some of the questions which I think the conference is going to cover. Okay, I just uh, pose what will China eventually become, a uh, status quo power, a revisionist power, what China will do with its uh, growing capacity, the next session will deal with it, how Beijing projects its power, et cetera, et cetera, and uh, uh, Ross also has dealt with it in the morning, and how it affects the online rule of games, of this, uh, including human rights, all this, what's the future, what order will be, all these, I think that most of um, the questions will be covered by this conference. But first of all, we have to, when we say China is a challenge, okay, if, if you look at the conference title, then what is, uh, then we have to understand what, what China challenge, challenge what? So we have to uh, first understand what are the hegemonic aspects of current order. Basically, I think the US-based order has four pillars, okay, Brand Wood Institute, NATO, uh, Global Trade Network, and American liberal uh, norms values. If I make a drawing, then US is the provider of public goods, then you have economic order, one arm, then we have a political security arm, arm another, another arm. Interesting, I want to make, I want to emphasize actually, the rise of China is achieved by joining the system, not outside the system. So this is, has to be made clear, okay? China benefits from the US-led global system. China joined the system since 1970s and become successful. But dialectically, the rise of China, the, uh, the success of China, in return, challenge the fundamental aspect of the system. See? Join the system and challenge the system. So the areas of Western hegemony, basically these four, def the, uh, security defense, uh, control production service, credit, finance, land, knowledge, ideas. If you look at the China's catch up, China actually is really challenge these key areas simultaneously. I don't have to go to uh, uh, each point in, in depth because that, uh, I only have 12, 30 minutes, but my, I think my PowerPoint will be dispatched uh, to, to the rest of the audience here. But if we try to collect elements of China's global behavior, global actions, then indeed I'm not wondering why this conference called the China Challenge, why the Western countries begin to ask questions about China's intention, about China's behavior. The BRICS, the Shanghai Organization, the, the, the uh, Baton Road, okay, the uh, new bank, two new banks, and according to uh, the diplomatic index, China actually has more uh, overseas diplomatic missions than the US. It's, it's to me, it's quite a big surprise. If you look at the recent uh, uh, a book about tech, tech uh, titans of China, and China and, and is actually building its own uh, system, when we talk about decoupling, Actually, indeed, uh, it's already decoupling in some areas. China has its own systems. We have WeChat, and you have Facebook. We have, uh, uh, in China, we have Alibaba, you have Amazon. Actually, already, okay, you have Starbucks, we have uh, what is called uh, Talking Coffee. It's a different system, okay. And now, actually, they say that um, uh, Ma uh, McDonald is totally be, become internalized. Uh, so, if you do not uh, inject into Chinese flavor, and you cannot sell uh, 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 McDonald. Then Africa, then Latin America, then 70 plus one. Then you have RCEP, this regional economic uh, uh, agreement. 
Then, not even mention Chinese yuan, the increased role of Chinese yuan, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. All this, you put together, then you wonder that uh, that uh, whether Chinese uh, threat or challenge is really uh, uh, real or not. Looks real. So there are ongoing parallel processes, the Chinese development and interaction with the world order. One process is that if you look at Chinese developed in the last uh, three decades or 40, uh, four decades, first, the old economic growth, labor intensive, okay, welcome all the capitals. The US took advantage of, the, of cheap labor and, and the market and transfer a lot of industry to China. Now China wants to move to the new model and this new model, consumption, innovation, high tech, which is in contradiction with the US uh, uh, expectation now. And the Chinese model state capitalism is so successful, uh, and now it's spreading to Latin America, to, to Africa, and China's ambition, 2021, that is uh, the 100 years uh, anniversary of Communist Party, 2025, it's about Chinese policy of becoming a key dominant, 2049, that's the 100 years of PRC, okay? These are Chinese visions, and you, then you, can, you look at another, it's not technology, uh, technology code war, two systems, standards, two internet. This is the Chinese development, and this is the impact. Security, political war, Taiwan, South Korea, Middle East, North Korea, norms, value, state market, democracy, human rights, and leading to perpetual conflict. So I look at these two parallel developments and, 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 and then China's challenge is also real again. Okay. So living in, in, in the West uh, for three decades, I'm, I'm thinking that now China's uh, rise has reached such a, a stage where the West is suffering what I call it China syndrome. You have, a, you have a two polarized views. One is uh, excessive approval, China, Chinese century, superpower, Chinese world order, Chinese global demand. This is uh, one of kind of uh, executive approval. Another is unwanted revulsion and deep pessimism. So this is trap, power transition, eventually war. And uh, Moshe Hammer, the, the religious school, uh, he openly uh, wondered, he said in Beijing actually during the interview, he wondered why US and China did not even have war now. Uh, he, his imagination is that you should have a war already, okay? And uh, globally, if you look at uh, that it, Huawei has become such a division in Europe too, and uh, according to Pew Research Center that uh, public opinions, global public opinions on, on, on US and China it become, uh, you know, uh, some much more favor China, some much more favor US, uh, and it's become so divided globally. Bad road become divided again, okay? That, uh, that some countries regard it as opportunity, some regard it as a threat, okay? And the China-US uh, war and, and uh, China's uh, policy, China development in uh, presence in Africa and, and uh, Latin America, you can see Chinese flag already covered the two continents, means that uh, China is becoming a dominant power in these two continents, and China is a new colonial and new imperial power. So all this put together, what I call it China syndrome. Even me, today, my dean of the university advised me not to speak to the journal, uh, a journalist as much as possible. Okay. Do not speak too much because they do not want to be labeled as uh, pro-China or whatever. So you are, you are very, uh, very kind of uh, courageous in inviting me. They say, maybe I'm a, I'm a spy, okay? <laughs> so if you go to the US, they can, you can be a spy, you can be a, 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 a threat. So my interpretation is that uh, the China-US conundrum, if I use two Chinese proverbs, one is called the riding tiger dilemma, another is two tigers cannot share a mountain. These two Chinese proverbs, riding tiger, human being, we ride horse, we never ride tiger. What's the difference between riding tiger and riding horse? It's when you're riding tiger, tiger is strong, fast, powerful, but you cannot get off anymore. 
you cannot get off, get, if you get off the tiger, you will be eaten by tiger. So U.S. and China, we are riding each other for three decades, and Trump wants to decop, decop, it's difficult, okay? But at the same time, that uh, one mountain can only be occupied, only one king, yeah? uh, Chinese perceive that the U.S. does not want China to play an equal role. And uh, I remember one of Australian pr uh, professors uh, visited Washington, asked Americans very openly, could you trade Chinese as equal power? And the answer is um, no. No answer, okay. They didn't answer, sorry, no answer. They avoid this. So you can see this. So these two move to what we call security dilemma spiral, that uh, country A's uh, empowerment of its its military is regarded by country B as having an evil intention. So that country B also strengthens its military power. It's being confirmed by uh, country A as B has also bad intention. So you can see this is a dilemma. Then move to what uh, Professor uh, Graham Erickson's uh, new book about uh, Suthida's trap. So there is a kind of this uh, kind of uh, movement. That's why that we have a, we are having a conference here. Um, my interpretation uh, is that at right now we are in a period of what we call transition from unilateral hegemony towards what I call interwined interdependent hegemony. So what I do is that I try to com decompose hegemony into different aspects. Okay. Then you can see that from this aspect, you can see the U.S. Or, or Europe are not the only unilateral power anymore. They are not able to hold the world order and defending this aspect unilaterally. They need China. They need emerging powers. So emerging power come in. But at the same time that both emerging power and, um, and existing power, they, have a, they are facing mutual challenge and accommodation, and in which that existing system's defenders and challenges are intertwined in a constant inter interactive process of shaping and reshaping the world order. This is what I call it, this is the process now, right now, and it's a difficult process. So my conclusion, uh, not solution, but conclusion, is that the world order is moving from unilateral hegemony towards interdependent hegemony, while the current transition period is full of great power rivalry. As this is what Ross this morning presented very clearly. What I, I call it, this is the transition period. China has a deep economic relationship with existing world powers. Decoupling is not easy. Uh, we are talking about emerging power, the BRICS. If you look at the BRICS, Within themselves, they have a very limited interactions. All BRIC countries, they have actually large, their largest economic partners are Western partners, not within themselves. So China's international leadership is featured with Chinese characteristics. One of my PhD students just finished a PhD that the, China, that, the, that the Chinese leadership, if they want to play a role, you cannot expect that China play the exactly the same role <coughs> as you play the way your behavior, the way your mind, mind mapping, the way that you're thinking. It has to be different, okay? So it's important to, to study. China is not providing alternative world order. I, I, I don't really don't like to listen to people talking about China is creating a new world order. No, I don't think so. And uh, with universal norms and values, China does not have a Chinese government claim all the time that China does not want to create a new world order. And I do not see any Chinese norms values are universally shared at, at this moment. I don't, I don't see. So, but China is leading the world order into independent hegemony. The future emerging world order will not be so-called Chinese world order, but you have to prepare that it will be unavoidably embedded with many Chinese characteristics. Uh, that is a matter of fact you have to accept, willingly or unwillingly. Thank you very much.